good afternoon and welcome. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you all with us today uh, for our session this afternoon uh, or this evening, uh, certainly for our presenter, as well as I'm sure some others who are joining us from other time zones. Um, for today's session, we have Dr. James Fadiman joining us, or Jim, as he's often known, um, speaking about microdosing. Um, and before we, I pass over to him, uh, I just have a short presentation, which many of you will be familiar with, just to run through Mind Medicine Australia and what we do and to give a little update with what's happening in Australia, because I feel that at this point in time, uh, there's a lot of people who are very eager to hear. And so to kick us off, in Australia, the mental health the, our mental health system is not in the best state, as is the case in a lot of places in the world at the moment. Uh, some of these statistics here, as you'll see, are quite alarming. One in five Australian adults had a chronic mental illness. That was pre-COVID-19. Uh, and from everything we've seen, that's not getting better. Uh, one in seven Australians on antidepressants. And that includes one in 30 children, uh, one in four older people. This leads to massive costs, uh, and that's most importantly to people's lives and to their suffering and potential. But there is also financial um, and economic costs that come along with that to society. And one of the challenges that we've had is with government and regulatory bodies with uh, resistance to change. And this is often the case with large systems, um, but certainly something that we have seen in the mental health systems. And so uh, the statement at the bottom, I think, is something that at MMA we've really seen very strongly since we started, which is that there's a lot of amazing clinicians out there working incredibly hard but it hasn't been tackling the problem. And so the elephant in the room, as we often say, is a lack of treatment innovation uh, in the mental health system. We've had relatively little innovation for 50 years and a lot of stalled treatment out outcomes. And so with depression, we have rates such as, uh, as low as 35% going into remission, PTSD even lower and extremely high relapse rates uh, with addiction. And when we look at when we look at um, indications such as eating disorders, we have huge treatment challenges. Um, and so again, so many amazing clinicians doing incredible work, but without quite the tools to, to get some people well. And so while some people are getting great results with what's currently available, the number of people who aren't being served by our current mental health treatments really is, um, it really is very substantial. And so a more of, a same, more of the same approach isn't going to solve this problem. And so, to introduce Mind Medicine Australia. We're a charity, a not-for-profit, focused on alleviating suffering through new treatment innovation, um, looking at it from a whole system approach. Our focus is on bringing psychedelic-assisted therapies into the health system in a controlled way um, so that they can be delivered in a way that is safe and effective. And we have a focus at this stage, largely on psilocybin and MDMA, and also this year increasingly starting to look at ketamine-assisted uh, psychotherapy as well, um, as particularly in the case of psilocybin and MDMA, these are the uh, psychedelic medicines that have the most developed uh, evidence basis behind them. The indications of success that we're working towards is that these therapies become an integral part of our mental health system. They achieve high remission rates, leading to a substantial improvement in those mental health statistics that I mentioned earlier. Um, and importantly, that they're accessible and affordable to all Australians um, who need them. And so to have a little bit of a look at how we're going about that at My Medicine Australia, we have four key strategic areas. The first of these is awareness and knowledge building. This is speaking with um, various stakeholder groups um, relevant to these ideas, uh, focusing on trying to raise awareness of the evidence um, uh, and the ways in which these treatments can be delivered and can potentially help uh, people with struggling with mental health. Awareness and knowledge building was a huge part of what we did to begin with, because four years ago when Mind Medicine Australia was started, the awareness in Australia of these therapies was extremely low. Um, as, as the space has developed, each of these other uh, areas has become more a uh, more significant part of what we're looking to do. So the second of these is our professional development program. This was first established when we started speaking with the TGA and they said, well, there's no one that could deliver these therapies in Australia. Why would there be any reason to look to make them more available, which created a chicken or egg program. So that's why we established Australia's first professional development uh, program for psychedelic assisted therapies. Um, the, our certificate is a part-time program delivered over four months. It has a world leading international faculty uh, and Jim um, is on that faculty, um, which we're so grateful for his support there. 
Uh, and in 2023, this year's course is actually beginning this coming Sunday. So we're really excited to be getting it underway for the year. Um, in addition, we've just recently begun a group supervision program for graduates of the course so that as clinicians are starting to deliver these therapies in Australia, they have opportunities to continue to learn um, from leaders in the field uh, around the world. Uh, this next area is in supporting uh, university research. Um, a couple of years ago, we obtained a $15 million grant, uh, and that was from the Liberal government at the time. Um, and so $15 million uh, government grant was at the time the largest in the world and may still be actually for psychedelic-assisted therapies. Um, we promoted the establishment of the Neuromedicines Discovery Centre um, at Monash University. And then we've directly funded a number of research, uh, research trials and including, as was announced last week from uh, ANU, uh, the establishment of a world first psychedelic registry. Um, and the aim of this registry is to collect data from the authorized prescriber program that's just about to get started in Australia with the delivery of MDMA and psilocybin assisted therapies for PTSD and treatment resistant depression. And then finally, patient access, supporting access to these medicines. Uh, and this is one that focuses on um, regulatory change, uh, which we've uh, pushed for over the last couple of years, as well as then looking towards um, clinic rollouts, helping with uh, availability and affordability of medicines um, and accessibility and affordability of treatments themselves. And so through working on all four of these, a substantial achievement that that took place earlier this year was when the TGA announced the rescheduling of psilocybin and MDMA. Um, as has been as has been quite largely reported on, uh, this is the first country in the world that has uh, formally recognized them as medicines by moving them from a banned substance classification into a controlled substance. Um, but as a part of this, we do have a heavy, heavy obligation on Australia to get this right. And so what does this mean? Just to give an overview uh, for anyone who is is relatively new to psychedelic assisted therapies. Psychiatrists who've done specialist training in psychedelic assisted therapy can apply to become an authorized prescriber for, of MDMA for patients with PTSD and psilocybin for patients who have treatment resistant depression. To apply, a psychiatrist must first submit details of their treatment protocols, which need to be evidence-based, the clinical, clinical justification for wanting to prescribe these treatments uh, and the training they've been to, to a research, a research ethics committee. Once a research ethics committee has approved their, um, their proposal, then they can put an application with the TGA to become an authorized prescriber. And then as an authorized prescriber, they will be able to prescribe MDMA and psilocybin for the indications I just mentioned for patients who've failed with currently available treatments. So that's perhaps quite an important um, point is that it's not, they won't be available as a first line treatment, only as a second line treatment. The treatment protocols, they uh, will involve generally one to three dosing sessions is what we've seen in the trials uh, with psychotherapy before and after each dosing session. And so just to give a little bit of an overview for anybody that's interested in understanding where things are at at the moment. Uh, the authorized prescriber scheme, it began on July 1st. This was the date that the TGA put in place. Um, however, it is something that will take some time for psychiatrists to go through this application process. As you may be able to surmise from what I just mentioned, it's a relatively significant and detailed application that's required to be put in. And then the ethics committees, there's likely to be some back and forth as they, as they determine what they're comfortable with. And in addition to this, the TGA announced last week they're preparing some additional guidance that they'll be publishing before the end of July. So this is likely to factor into the process that psychiatrists are going through as they're looking to become authorized prescribers. And so we're hoping to see authorized prescribers beginning to deliver treatment over the next couple of months, hopefully by the end of this quarter. And so covering all of that off, just as a couple of aspects of our programs and things that we have coming up, as I mentioned, uh, this year's Certificate in Psychedelic Assisted Therapies is beginning this coming Sunday. Uh, for any clinicians who are interested in getting trained, we would encourage you to come and reach out and start a conversation with us about joining the cohorts for next year, um, which will have dates of those uh, finalized shortly. Uh, for anyone who has already completed that program, uh, our supervision program for graduates is kicking off next week, actually, um, with Dr. Ben Sessa doing his first uh, supervision these are small group sessions that give an opportunity for clinicians who are looking to either start working or have started working to bring in questions and cases uh, for group discussion, as we feel this is a really important part of ensuring continued development uh, and best practice and sharing of knowledge. Uh, and then finally, 
Uh, our events. So obviously today we have Jim with us uh, speaking on microdosing. Our upcoming webinars over the next few months, we have a number of amazing speakers. We have Dr. Phil Wolfson, Dr. Rachel Harris um, joining in September, in October, Wade Davis, and then we have Gabor Mate uh, speaking in December. So this is really, really exciting events to round out the rest of the year. So please do jump on our website, on our events page and register for those so that you can join us for those again. And with that, as just a final note, a couple of points, that is, please do stay informed as a way to help. If you're able to support us financially, we really do support that. We do uh, we do run from the support of the community. Uh, help us to keep building momentum and building awareness. And, and please join us with volunteering. Reach out to our chapters program. This is something that in the second half of the year, we're looking to really uh, look to, to put a lot of energy into really building a lot of vibrancy in the chapters um, there. And please join us and reach out and be involved. And so with that, that's enough from me. Uh, as just a few words to introduce Jim. He is someone who needs very little introduction. He's been involved in psychedelics for, for many years. He was researching LSD in Stanford uh, back in the 60s, if I have that right. Um, and since then, since the research lull that came into place soon afterwards, he's done uh, a long list of incredibly amazing work, including he founded the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, which is now called Sophia University. He's published uh, a wide variety of books. Um, perhaps for many here, they would be most familiar with the Psychedelic Explorer's Guide, but also in 2020, he published Your Symphony of Selves, Discover and Understand More of Who You Are. And if I'm not mistaken, he is currently working on a book which may have a working title the same as what we're speaking about today, um, about microdosing. And so I'll pass you over to Jim and to just say a huge thank you, Jim. We really do appreciate having you joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it is really, oh, it's a rare pleasure that I uh, get to be as close to Australia as I am tonight. Um, some of you know that I almost um, I left the United States with my family to settle in Tassie, but um, uh, the United States recovered a little bit of sanity. I probably made a mistake in not coming. Um, and now I'm I'm excited to talk to people in the first country in the world to allow its citizens to have access to substances that are healing. Um, the idea that any country would prevent its citizens from access to substances that are healing um, has a kind of cultural insanity, which the United States promulgated and pressured as much as possible. So it is a pleasure to see a country in recovery. And after recovery, as you know, is integration and healing and um, a whole new set of possibilities. And as I was looking at the slides, um, it is incredibly depressing to go into mental health with such with the tools that we have developed so far, uh, many of which are simply not very helpful. Uh, and uh, those are acceptable. And and we're going to now look at the, um, I feel a little awkward after that wonderful introduction by Scott about how formal and formalized and careful and layers of um, training people have to work with uh, high dose substances. And I'm gonna to talk tonight about microdoses, which are predominantly used without almost any of those um, very careful uh, kind of guardrails, probably because microdoses are, um, because they have a much smaller effect, are simply safer. And the question of effectiveness is, we'll look at that a little bit this evening. And the goal from where we, where we are in total harmony, the goal is to, is to learn what helps people use psychedelics wisely and well. And obviously higher doses demand much more care. Um, we'll see that lower doses have, have just a different framework. And as yet, uh, do not, don't have a, a legal framework um, in Australia or in the US, but um, there is some legal framework in parts of Europe. And my friend, Amanda Fielding, who 
um, has been um, an incredible researcher for, while the rest of us kind of gave up for a number of years as the government stopped us, Amanda just kept doing research. And what she's saying is, what we want to know is what doses produce what results. So we're looking at different doses for different results, and that, that makes a certain amount of sense. And so I'll be talking about very low doses. And what is microdosing? Let me be formal. Um, microdosing involves repeated intermittent self-administration of small amounts of psilocybin or LSD or some other substances at doses large enough to improve daily activities and conditions and small enough so that normal consciousness is not clouded or impaired. In other words, microdoses are given in a small enough amount so that people do not need a special treatment location. Um, they are um, able to drive, use heavy machinery, um, do psychotherapy, um, do coding, basically to run your NV with your kids. Um, basically normal behavior. Normal behavior, perhaps with a kind of enhancement um, that, is, that is not found with other, with other substances. Uh, for some of you who are um, more interested in the physical nature of, a, of the substance, we're talking seven to 12 micrograms of LSD, uh, one-tenth of a gram to four-tenths of a gram of mushrooms. That's approximately the dose range for most people. A number of people, however, find even a much, much lower dose range is just as effective. So the rules for microdosing, and I'll give it to you so that you can remember them, because remember, we're talking about more than one dose. We're talking about intermittent doses over a period of time. Start low, meaning at the bottom of the range of what's a useful dose. Go slow, which means don't take it too often and don't raise the dose and take time off. This is, again, for protocols that have been developed over independently around the world where people have found that when you microdose, it's useful and it's useful that your system takes time off to integrate uh, physiologically and emotionally uh, the changes that have been made so that your body basically retains the healing and you're not dependent on a substance. Now, again, I'm talking to those of you with more experience, but if you're disappointed that while you feel good, you've microdosed, you feel good, but you don't even have a small high, you're probably dosing it exactly correctly. If you're not feeling better or more effective or in less pain in several doses, you're probably not getting enough and you would need to raise your dose a very small amount. But don't do that too quickly uh, because the goal of microdosing is to develop your own physiological and mental condition so that you are taking less and less and eventually stop microdosing. Remember, SSRIs tend to be um, as your physician has told you, don't worry, you're only going to take this for the rest of your life. Um, that's not very encouraging, and microdosing really, uh, it works the other way. Now, I'm going to be able, now that we're a few years into the research and into reports, to make a few generalizations about the effect, the effectiveness, limitations, and some of the implications. So in my world, for the last 12 years, I've been asking for, receiving, reading, and commenting, and going back and forth with people around the world who have written me about their own experience. This is people in research, uh, physicians, uh, professors, clinicians, and a great deal of what we call citizen scientists, uh, which is really where it all has to end. Uh, no matter what we find in a research setting, um, it honestly doesn't matter if it doesn't work in the real world. Um, normally, pharmaceuticals start with nobody has access, then only laboratories and research groups, and then clinical groups. And very, very late in the game, you go to your physician and, and he says, or he, she says, I have a new substance that I've just been sent. I think it might help you. That's real world. And we microdosing because we have 
Uh, we have thousands and thousands of years of data. Um, the oldest data, by the way, comes from Australia. Um, we're doing it the other way. We have to rely first on citizen science, and that has directed and alerted the research community in what directions to study. So um, the major findings is the microdosing is effective over a wider range of conditions, including physical and mental illness, depression, chronic pain, social anxiety, migraines, and for health enhancing um, conditions, which are, we might call creativity, improved learning, uh, that's demonstrated in students by they get higher grades, uh, athletic uh, performance. This is from a martial arts person saying, I, I used to win silver medals. Now, after microdosing, I win gold medals. That's what we call real world evidence. And it's what we're going to be looking at in some depth. So I want to look at major conditions, uh, one mental, one physical, uh, which are the most common conditions in each of those categories. What's the, the, the leading mental illness that the world has had? Depression. Now, notice, by the way, that since antidepressants were developed, there has been a steady increase in depression over every single year. Now, if you think of anything else in the medical world, what you get is, oh, we have something that, that, that is working with child leukemia, and five years later, child leukemia is reduced by 80%. So we have a curious business here where how is it that with the, the growth of the antidepressant uh, medications, there's been a massive increase in depression. Now, those are not correlated, but, but they do make you look a little hard at whether the tools we have up till now have been working. And the answer is, for some people, yes, but not as many as we wish. So high-dose methods, which Scott really talked about, how do you deal with what's called treatment-resistant depression? I don't like the term because it kind of blames you for being treatment deficient, you know, shame on you, resistant, treatment resistant. And it isn't true at all. What it's saying is everything that your physician was able to give you didn't work. So uh, the blame is on the system, not on you. But let's look at the high dose methods. And uh, you had it described, I thought, very well. It's usually two sessions, um, therapy before and after and during. Um, in a recent study, for example, almost everyone was way less depressed the day after the session. This is measured on a standard, standard test. Six months later, 21% were still not depressed. Now, the positive is that mean, meant they had one or two sessions within maybe a week, and six months later, they had no symptoms. But that's only 21%. That's not, not, um, not a great number. And if you look at, that's just a, a very current study. If I look at it in general, what are the best cases, the best studies? It's about 80% effective for some amount of time. A few weeks, up to a year, maybe longer. Um, Long-term studies are very hard to do uh, and very rare. And uh, by the way, for antidepressants, there's almost no research on long-term effectiveness, even though it's almost always given as a long-term medication. So if we look then at microdose studies, again, it's one of the very, very common reasons that people wish to microdose. Um, about 80% effective as well. Um, and it breaks into two groups. There's a group that after a certain amount of microdosing, stops taking the substances and they feel their depression has been taken care of. It's no longer part of their life. A different group after the same amount of time, also feeling that the depression is not present, feels that continuing to microdose less often um, is necessary. And um, it's hard to, we don't really have the research of what distinguishes those two groups, but that's, that's where we are. Now, the reports you get when you're 
asking people how is the what is the effect like for you and what you get is very simple i'm back i feel like myself the way i was before depression i have all my feelings which i haven't had for 31 years And on those 31 years, I've been on all kinds of antidepressants. And some of you know enough about antidepressants to know what people complain about, that it, it dampens your, your basically ability to have feelings, which is fine if you don't want to have very bad feelings, but it also dampens good feelings. So I want to give you what I call real world evidence. And uh, this is a woman 26. Um, she has been microdosing for three weeks. And what she said, and think about yourself, problems I felt I had before microdosing. Now, this is someone with no pathology, no previous mental illness, and, and, and again, fairly rare, only depression. I had before microdosing feelings of hopelessness, low energy all the time, social anxiety, canceling plans due to panic about going out, avoiding friends and loved ones, reduced sex drive, irritability, eating to make myself feel better, no surprise, weight gain, unable to be silent, meaning unable to be in a quiet setting, always having the distraction of the TV, the phone, the podcast, spending the majority of my time in bed or on the sofa, headaches more than four times a week, grinding my teeth in my sleep, unmotivated to do basic things like clean, shower, brush my teeth, take care of my skin, stress, feeling that I'm living only to worry about what's going to happen next, feeling numb, I don't really care about stuff, only being able to socialize if I drank, feeling depressed after drinking. I hope that you recognize none of those symptoms. Now, let's look at what she reports after three weeks of microdosing. Overall sense of peace, able to do things with more deliberation, able to focus more on the moment at hand and not just be stressing about what's coming. Higher sex drive, parentheses, enjoy sex again. Stop grinding my teeth, less headaches, not none, just less less irritated with loved ones, not unirritated, enjoy seeing friends, socializing, feeling more engaged in conversation, not using food as a comfort, weight loss, parenthesis, unintentionally, meaning she just, her eating pattern has shifted. So that's something we see a lot of. Able to enjoy moments without my phone or distraction. I want to be outside more and have more experiences in general excited about things again, enjoying self-care, and able to socialize and have fun without drinking. That's what we're looking at. That's what we call real-world evidence. And that's someone who's been taking the substance now um, every few days. Now, and this is someone who had demonstrated clinical depression. She'd been to a physician. She'd been advised to go on SSRIs. And after talking with her friends, uh, started looking for an alternative. Now, let me give you a different case. Now, this is someone who has, again, no prior mental condition. This is an older, this in this case, it's a man, it's an older man, retired, um, who just begins to be aware that he's not happy. And doesn't really call it depression until he begins to realize that that he has a classic depression, which is happy thing, good things don't make him any happier, bad things uh, don't make him any less unhappy. He's just a low level of happiness. What he says is, Dr. Fadiman, on your podcast, you ask for stories. Here is mine. I've been depressed for the last few months. I couldn't remember when I'd last been simply happy. I hadn't recognized my depression. I just thought it was a lot of life stress. On the advice of a friend, I took a microdose, a gummy, a tenth of a gram. 
he said it helped him sleep better, nothing else. He was not asking about depression. He was not looking for improved happiness. He simply was told this might help him with some sleep issues. Slept better, also felt better and worked better. That afternoon on my usual walk, I recognized that I was genuinely happy. This is one dose. I'm semi-retired and have injuries. Walking often is painful. But that day I felt like dancing and I did, just a few steps, not done that in years. I began to write a poem. I realized it was a children's song. And he says, it's nice to be alive. It's better when you thrive, but even when you die, then you struggle and you strive. It's nice to be alive. Before my walk was over, I had written six more verses, did two more little dances. I hope this is helpful for your research. And the answer is it's very helpful because we don't know why one single dose would have that strong an effect. What we assume and are pretty clear about that unless this person continues microdosing, it will only be the effect. What we know is that, and this is from work with individual neurons, that neurons that are grown whatever you feed neurons, you know, Purina neuron chow. Um, if you have, and you're growing your neurons in the lab with your normal nutrition and you're growing some with an addition of microdoses, what you will find is the neurons literally are larger and healthier. They're more complex. They have more dendrites. They have more capacities to communicate with other neurons. Um, it looks like the person with three weeks was already showing that the new neurons were beginning to, to, to be established as part of their, their mental capacity. That's a look at depression. Uh, if we look at a couple of other medical conditions for which there's been a, a great many cases that we have in the files for improvement is my, chronic migraines. Chronic migraines, again, they don't go away. What they do is diminish in intensity and how often. So letter from a woman that said, when I was checking up on her, she said, I had a migraine several days ago, lasted 36 hours. And I, I wrote, as you would, something kind. And she said, no, no, don't worry about it. I used to have 20 a month. She had one a month. That is worth, that's where people begin to do research. Um, PMS, again, for a certain, certain half of you, um, periods are either easy and normal or they're difficult, either painful physically or emotionally. Uh, microdosing seems to, seems to shift the internal balance of hormones that are changing into the uh, healthier pattern. So uh, the first case we had was an art historian in, uh, in England who said I microdosed um, and had my first normal period in my life. So we asked some people who study that to start to look into what's going on. And what we're looking at is, is in each of these cases, the thing that's in common is a disequilibrium in the system shows up as depression, as migraines, as PMS. And when the system is back in better equilibrium, the symptoms go away. So these are not um, symptom specific treatments as most medications are. This is system imp improvement. And that's what we're looking at. Now, I mentioned that we're talking about a lot of medical conditions. Uh, there's also, I mentioned normal, normal functioning. Um, and this is uh, a lot of college students who you know um, use experiment with, with everything that's available. And this is from students, more focus, listen better. I can even listen to bad professors. And having been a professor, that's very, very exciting. <laughs> even if you're not doing a good job, if your students are microdosing, they'll be paying better attention. I easily recall the details of a PowerPoint. I just have to look once. I don't have to keep looking back and forth and back and forth as I'm trying to take notes. Grades going from Bs to As. 
Now, that's those are a little abstract, and I always like, if I can, to have real world evidence, a case. This is a, someone, a maths major uh, at a top tier college. Uh, he loves maths, but he said it's always a struggle. While microdosing, I decided to take the hardest class in the catalog. Quote, I did well and without much stress. Now, actually, I'm cheating. That was not the real quote. He said I just sailed through. But that's so, um, that's kind of pushing it a bit. But that's, that was his comment. Um, now, notice in the depression that the person with the child, the childish song, had said he'd taken it for better sleep. So one of the things when you're doing research, um, you look for unintended uh, effects. Now, with medications, usually we call them side effects, and we always mean something negative, but there are no side effects. There are only effects. There are effects that you want, and there are effects you don't want. Well, what we keep finding when people are microdosing for one condition or another, um, they report you know, and our, the way we did it is take it every uh, every one day off, two days, one day on, two days off. Take a daily checklist of moods and make some notes. At the end of a month, review what's happened over the month and see if there's some pattern that you can see. What we saw over and over again: less alcohol, less cannabis, less coffee, better sleep improved diet my favorite was a, a a genuine junk food junkie who wrote i looked at the menu and by god i wanted a salad great revelation in his life um more exercise and and more meditation now notice these were all uh, conditions that they hadn't asked for now what you're looking at is if if you said well why would they want less alcohol, less cannabis, and less coffee? My God, even coffee. And the answer is, if you think about it, you take those things to shift your mood or to shift your energy. If your energy is good and your mood is good, you tend not to want them. And remember the girl with a serious depression who turned it around said, I can now socialize without having to drink. So that's what we're looking at. Um, as well, because that's what people are reporting. Remember, everything I'm telling you are reports that have come in over the years, and I'm talking literally thousands of reports. Um, my early research was 51 countries. A later group called microdose.me has reports from 80 countries. So this is, microdosing is out there in this world. Now, however, most of the research and all of the, almost all the high dose research has been on medical concerns because that's, um, as that slide pointed out, that's where the, that's where the the pain is. And actually, the most common physical concern is chronic pain, more so than depression, because pain is a part of so many other conditions. So. Um, let me give you a couple of studies. This is from Amanda Fielding's group in England called the Beckley Foundation. Uh, and the, the title, I love it when the title is good enough so you don't have to read the whole study. A low dose of lysergic acid diethylamide decreases pain perception in healthy volunteers. Okay, so now you know the conclusion. The study, which has a certain charm, there's a, there's a standard way of measuring whether something affects pain is you have ice water, water with a lot of ice in it, so it's as cold as you can get it before it freezes, and you put your hand in it, and the, the clock starts, and you put your hand in it until you can't stand it, and you pull your hand out, and the clock stops. It's, it's, a, it's a lovely study because, uh, as you can tell, the equipment's cheap. Um, you can do it with your phone or your watch, and it's very clear when you're the person uh, with your hand in the ice water um, that no matter how you know how tough you decide to be at some point it's too much so it turns out that if you use a high dose of lsd or a low dose of lsd both of those 
allowed you to keep your hand in the water more than similar studies done with opiates. Now keep that in mind. That's a rather extraordinary finding that these substances, which have none of the side effects of opiates, were as effective in this particular uh, kind of peculiar uh, study. Again, we're looking, this is a research study and we'll look at real world evidence in a moment. But uh, the Beckley people and Amanda did another study where they were surveying pa chronic pain sufferers. And what they found is people reported what worked for them and what didn't. And the most effective way of diminishing chronic pain was high doses of psychedelics. Now, the problem with high doses of psychedelics is um, you can't take them very often. In fact, if you take them often, they, they quickly lose effectiveness. Um, less effective than high doses were microdoses, but microdoses can be taken over a long period of time. Less effective than high doses and low doses, this is real people with real chronic pain from a variety of major conditions. My, microdosing was even less effective than microdosing was opiates. Less effective than opiates, no surprise, over-the-counter, uh, things like Tylenol, Aleve, aspirin, etc. Now, cannabis, which also is very interesting for pain control, not our topic here, and it wasn't in that study. So uh, let me give you a, free, a few real-world cases to suggest how much help might be possible for serious pain. This is a client of a, a United States microdosing coach named Adam Branlich, 70-year-old contractor working on a roof, fell off the roof, broke bones throughout his body. Two years after of healing, the bones were healed, but he was still in too much pain to function. After several months of microdosing, he successfully reduced the daily pain enough to resume working as a contractor. That's real world. Another case, this is someone who uh, a piece of heavy machinery fell on his back, broke his back in two places, high and low. He was told there was an operation that might restore him. And he said, what do you mean might? What happens if it doesn't work? They said, well, you'll never walk again. He said, I think I'll stay with pain. And he actually went on opiates successfully, not raising the dose, not all the addiction problems you know about under careful medical supervision um, for a number of years, able to do hard physical labor until in the US the laws changed and his physician could no longer basically give him the correct dose. Um, the physician, by the way, quit medicine at that point and left the United States because he couldn't help people anymore. And this poor guy was left with chronic pain. He found microdosing on his own. He actually raised his own mushrooms because he didn't want to be breaking laws. And what he said is, when I have microdoses, my pain is a tingle. Without them, the pain is unbearable. So we're looking at some remarkable um, remarkable possibilities. And I want to give you now uh, in a little more detail um, because, um, well, you'll see. This is a woman who, uh, 59 years old, her back was broken 20 years ago. She's been in pain from that. She has a genetic defect of excessive motility, meaning her ligaments don't hold her bones well together. Um, people who have that end up with a lot of injuries. She's had three different joints in her body replaced, and she's in constant pain. She microdoses. This is um, in Mexico, where she got it from the local the local market, along with you know mangoes and papayas. Um, microdosing every other day for the first two doses. Sleep was great. Pain subsided overnight. 
Now this was September, half mid-September 2022. Her second comment is from October. This again, about three weeks of microdosing. Waking up is different now. Before microdosing, someone would have to rouse me from sleep and I would have to laboriously push through webs of myofascial nerve and muscle pain to even form words. I would take lethal doses of ibuprofen, an opioid, depression, and anxiety meds while lying flat. It would take 40, 20 to 40 minutes after taking the meds before I could sit up without sheer pain, but still with substantial pain, let alone walk. With my first stand and step, my energy for the day would begin to pour out from my body. A shower or interaction early guaranteed exhaustion for the day. Weather would exacerbate this. Rain, cold, season change, humidity, barometric changes, etc. Today, this is October 2nd, it's cold, raining cats and dogs, and the room I woke in is cold. I woke up on my own and without moving, looked around with my eyes, curious what the day would bring. I gently realized I felt no more nerve, no muscle, and no myofascial pain. I felt like a child. It reminded me in that moment of when I'd wake before my mom and smile knowing I could find something fun to do myself before anyone else woke. I didn't feel like a senior in my body when I woke. I felt like I did as a kid. Even my mind felt the joy and wonder of a new day and wondering what it would bring, not how am I just going to get through the day. That's what we're looking at. And that's the data we're getting, again, real world data from real people. And I actually know uh, this person and have known her for some years. Um, so I can, I, I'm very aware of the um, the remarkable. Uh, she just, you know, is transformed and 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 says so. Now, just give you another few areas because the the span again suggests we're not talking about focusing on the on the symptom or even on that section of the body or an organ system, but we're focusing on the body. Shingles, shingles is fascinating because shingles isn't physical. Um, meaning it isn't a, a, a part of your organ system in trouble. It isn't a mental condition. It's a virus that you had if you had chicken pox as a child. It's been hiding in the bottom of your nerve cells, waiting for you to be either older or under some extreme stress. And it reemerges. And the, the primary symptom is simply pain. Um, for most people, it's in the mid body but it can be anywhere inside of your mouth, in your eyes, vagina, and it can lead to lasting damage. Um, by the way, just there is a new vaccine, um, two shots. It's 97% effective for younger people. It's about 80% effective for people over 60. Um, I strongly recommend you look into it if you don't know about it. Shingles um, is no joke. And if you had chicken pox as a child, you are, I think it's like one in five people will have shingles unless they get the vaccine. So why did, how, nobody would ever suggest microdosing for shingles, except I get an email from Zambia. And don't worry, you know, it's kind of in Africa, but you couldn't find it on the map. It's okay. We're all in the same boat. Is a person who said his his shingles had happened three months earlier, no vaccine. And he had gotten to the place where there was no position he could sleep in that wasn't extreme pain. And he was in the capital of Zambia and a friend of his, he had no psychedelic experience or knowledge or interest, but a friend of his said, why don't you try this mushroom? It might help your shingles. And 45 minutes later, his pain was sufficiently reduced that he felt, you know, that he was like a new human being. Um, and then he said that when he would have a, a kind of twinge that would lead perhaps to shingles, he would simply 
take another dose. I was so excited with this that I, I tried to find where was my, my colleague, because we'd been getting these reports from all over the world. Now, she was in Prague. I'm in California. She was in Prague presenting for both of us at an international conference. I couldn't reach her. When I finally did, and I told her with great excitement about shingles, she said, oh, yeah, that's really cool. I thought, come on, come on, you're supposed to get excited. This is, this is, this is really cool. She said, well, there were two people at the Prague conference who came up to me and threw their arms around me and wept and thanked me for our work, shingles. So, uh, so we've been looking at that and, and I worked very closely with someone with shingles um, and she was basically kind of crumpled in pain and unhappy and depressed and, and, feeling, and, and feeling deeply unattractive as well. Um, she took a, she took an initial microdose and her pain went away for eight hours. And as she worked with it, she needed to take it um, again, totally different than any other dosing. Every eight hours and every nine hours, finally every twelve hours, and was out of pain. Now, what was interesting about her is she said, "It's wonderful because I don't have the pain of shingles," but she said, "I also feel." revived in a deeper sense i feel uh, physically better i feel my my lost vitality and my overall health has it changed she said i'm i'm returning i have more mobility i have more balance uh, i'm even feeling much more i'm feeling for the first time like a woman i've not felt that in some years and then she uh demonstrated a few balance moves that she said i simply couldn't do this for years this is like standing on one foot and just some other dance moves. Quite extraordinary. And again, notice that she took it for shingles, and shingles doesn't affect all those other systems. So we don't really know um, how it works, but we know that it often does work. Let's look at traumatic brain injury. Traumatic brain injury means that the physical brain is physically damaged. War sports, a number of sports, uh, hockey being probably the worst, car crashes. Um, now, again, here's, here's one of Adam's, my friend, the coach, one of his clients, professional hockey player. Professional hockey players, um, it's part of what happens in hockey. People hit each other and hit each other as hard as they can. That's why they held the helmets. Very, very common to have concussions and to retire early. This particular gentleman had had retirement. He'd had all the therapies that are available and he couldn't get over his headaches and he mainly didn't leave his darkened bedroom uh, because so much of head throbbing pain. So he began microdosing and coaching and he recovered enough so he got engaged. He got married and important for the work that I'm doing, stopped microdosing. He was completely restored as far as he was concerned. There was no need for whatever microdosing was for for him. And again, we go back to the brain cells. What we find with traumatic brain injury is the brain is actually starting to repair and that that isn't something that the rest of medicine uh, has had any very, very little success with. Um, there's another person I know named Daniel Carcillo. Uh, if you know about hockey, there's a term called the enforcer. That's the person who starts the fights. And he literally was the enforcer for a Heisman Trophy level team. Um, and when he was retired at age 30, um, he was asked by a reporter, how many concussions do you have? He said, well, seven registered. And the man said, well, do you have any others? He said, about 100. And Daniel retired. Again, he said a lot of money. He spent $200,000 in two years going to every major trauma treatment center that was recommended. Some help, but not enough. And he was sitting in his garden deciding whether suicide was the best thing he could do for his family. 
And at that point, someone recommended psilocybin to him. He had a high dose, followed by microdoses. And when I met him, he was establishing a corporation called Wisana um, and getting it registered on the Canadian stock market to establish the best possible protocols for brain trauma because it is incredibly common, unfortunately, and, and the recovery of actual brain functioning is very rare. So that's out there. Uh, other areas that would not seem to be appropriate for psychedelics is cluster headaches. Cluster headaches, if you don't know about them, terrific, keep your ignorance. They are the worst pain known to human beings. And well-established data with a group called clusterbusters.com, um, very high doses, took away the pain, allowed these people to function like human beings. So also it's called suicide headaches because so many of the people with them simply kill themselves rather than have more. Over the years, their advice to people on their website has been for lower and lower doses. And they've found now that kind of a high microdose is enough. That's like two tenths of a, like five tenths of a gram, six tenths of a gram. They used to recommend five to eight grams. And any of you that know about psilocybin is that's, that's a massive dose. So we're learning uh, a lot. Now also diminish smoking, drinking, and, a, and an interesting one is called procrastination. And when I began to get reports of people saying, I'm no longer procrastinating, I had this, this moment of fear, which is the pharmaceutical people are going to leap on this and say, hooray, if people can get better from procrastination, all we have to do is call it a disease and we can invent substances for people to take. Well, microdosing may, may be enough. So we're looking now, this is now, we have very few cases, but we're looking at it. And we're looking at long COVID. We have some amazing studies with strokes, dementia. Um, when I last talked last year to an Australian group and said, if any of you have something very interesting, let me know. Um, that started us looking for an epilepsy cases, uh, a woman in New Zealand who wrote us. Um, we're starting to look at that. Uh, Long-term Lyme. And we have, a, uh, there's both a journal article, peer reviewed journal and a couple of cases and lupus. These are, um, these are conditions where the body is attacking itself, lupus. And the woman that I've studied for several years now, she's been just wonderfully helpful. She started taking, when she started microdosing, she was on 18 meds. And she had a list of 30 symptoms one to 10, 10 being unbearable. And she would give me a total of what her symptoms were. Her maximum was 300. She was running right 250 and 18 meds. In one month, she was down to eight meds, some of those with lower doses. And her symptom count was now in the like 150. Over the last three years, she has been taking daily, um, filling out her, this is her form, by the way, the symptom form. Um, she's down to 20, maybe sometimes 10. This is out of the 300. And it's mainly that she still has some sleep issues. We have not explored this in any great depth, but um, having one real life case in great detail, it turns out um, research says, oh no, you can't do that. It, one person doesn't count, but science says use it all the time. Um, one case, one case wakes you up to the possibility. Two cases says it can, it isn't, it isn't a genetic rarity. And three cases is more than enough to start doing serious research. So a couple of things I just want to mention briefly so we don't waste time on them in the Q&A. This is now a little bit of the science stuff. Um, studies are called double blind which means neither the person nor the researcher or the physician or the clinician knows what the person has. Um, it's absolutely necessity if you want to make money on pharmaceuticals. That's what our Food and Drug Administration and yours as well is, is a necessity. Now, any of you who've used psychedelics know that, that is a, a, an unbelievably pointless and worthless thing to do since everybody knows. 
within an hour. Believe me, it's kind of, you say, well, we're going to do a double blind study. Here's, uh, here's like 24 ounces of water and here's 24 ounces of vodka. Now, we're not going to tell you which is which. And we're now going to do a study because we were looking, we need to, dis, we need to look at the double blinds. And we all say, that's really dumb. Any of us who've drunk know that we'll know. And any of us who've drunk water also know that we'll know. So it's out there. You're going to see it forever. It's not useful. But it is useful if you're trying to make, uh, trying to, you know, kind of late stage capitalism. Um, there is something called the placebo effect. The placebo effect, which researchers don't like, but we all are alive only because of the placebo effect. It really is the natural healing capacity of the body. And it's what we all depend on and what we want medication to, to expand and to use as much as possible. So there are, um, there are questions out there. Is microdosing really nothing more than just a placebo? Just the human being healing themselves? Just their expectation? And there are some studies that says, yes, that's all we've measured. And the only difference between people microdosing and people who think they might be microdosing um, is their expectation. Most of the studies, however, are in the other direction. And uh, I think the definitive study was done by a, a postdoc named Connor Murray, and now at UCLA, and a, a group of other people, where they measured brain wave changes. Now you all know enough about psychedelics to know that they change the wiring in your brain and they change. You've seen the, the picture of uh, the brain with just a few little lines on it and then the brain with a whole lot of colored lines. And the whole lot of colored lines says that's what psychedelics do. They increase the number of colored lines in the brain. Well, they, it turns out those colored lines can be measured in their particular parts of the brain. And to nobody's surprise, except the placebo people, people who were given a low enough dose of a microdose, so they actually couldn't tell whether they were dosed or not, very, very low, showed the brainwave changes, if you had the microdose, exactly the same brainwave areas as for higher doses, just with lower amplitude. Um, and for those of you that are not in science, that's what you would expect it anyway. Uh, a last one that comes up, there's a rumor out there that microdosing might in hurt your heart valves with a rare problem. And there are substances which do that uh, in vastly higher doses taken over a long period of time, including MDMA, which is not taken over a long period of time in any medical setting or for any medical condition, uh, and others. And this is now a quote from a, a study that's under review, Journal of Psychopharmacology. There's no data, no evidence, and no likelihood, even from those worrying about it, partly because time off, we talked about start low, go slow, and take time off. Um, and they conclude there's no evidence for psychedelics causing cardiac valvulopathy with chronic use, chronic use meaning microdosing. So that will save us a question, hopefully, when we get there. Um, I have a comment about legality, but we're in a funny world, which is um, Australia now is finding out what it's like when you begin to make things legal as you set up a system to, to handle it. Uh, we're doing it with a couple of states in the states. Um, we don't yet have a legal structure to handle microdosing, except for the countries that say, um, it's a, you take a very small amount. Um, it's, it's safer than any, but almost any pharmaceutical. Um, here is some microdoses, um, just the way here is a bottle of aspirin. Um, but we don't have that. Uh, it, it's still illegal in most countries. Now, okay. I just, let me, let me just, end because I do want to get to questions and I want to remind you of this what happened and, and remember let's go to the high doses for a moment remember they are in a therapeutic assisted system where there's therapy before to get you comfortable with the people you're going to be with therapy during if you need it 
and always integration and therapy afterwards. Why is that necessary? It turns out that one of the common effects of high doses, and we, we knew about it in the 60s, we just didn't know quite what to do with it, is called the afterglow, which is people retain a great deal of the benefits that they have felt on that first day. Remember the depression study where everyone felt better. And during that period, people are more flexible and more open and more able to process therapeutic issues and so forth. It turns out, and there's some research by a wonderful research, a last name of Dolan, who talks about critical periods in one's development where the brain retains its flexibility or regains its flexibility, in this case with psychedelics. Um, we know it, we have animal studies where the, basically the animals get act as if they were much younger after psychedelics because the basic critical period that we all know about is called childhood. Those of you who know several languages, <clears throat> the best time you to have learned them is when you were very young. The brain is more flexible. So we're finding that one of the after effects of the psychedelic is this open mind period in which therapeutic benefit is enormously um, improved and made easier and more effective. So remember um, the real world case of that 59 year old woman. And what she said is, I don't feel like a senior in my body. I felt as I did as a kid, even my mind felt the joy and wonder a new day would bring. That's what is meant by the opening of the critical period. And it's one of the, the not yet well totally explained or explored um, benefits of, of, of psychedelics embedded therapy. So conclusion, if I can make one, it's likely that microdoses will become, a, become part of mainstream medicine because they have none of the scary mental effects of high doses, none of the, none of the visions, none of the terrors, and also none of the high costs. I've seen the estimates of what it will cost someone in Australia or the cost of the government for um, several sessions, and it's a lot of money. Uh, microdoses are, um, the ratio is about a thousand to one in terms of cost. That's worth noticing. If the goal is, as was described in, in, in Scott's original remarks, equity and availability. And you can take it, you, the reason that for no high cost is no need for the special staff and clinics. You take it at home over an extended period. What it does over time, it maximizes what we call neuroplasticity. That's the brain growing better and, and newer cells and setting and establishing new habits. MDMA is the best therapy we know for reducing and eliminating the symptoms of active post-traumatic stress disorder. You notice I didn't mention that for microdosing. Um, there is some data that some people report that with microdosing, they also have helped their post-traumatic stress disorder, but we're still exploring that. So what's gonna happen or what's already happened is microdosing is more and more widely accepted. It's not legal, but accepted expansion of uses. There are a few companies now beginning to do studies using microdoses. Um, there's scads of clinical reports. And we have now the rise of microdose coaches. There's international organizations. Um, there's international trainings. I've been working with people all over South America uh, and in Europe and in the United States. These are different training groups only for microdosing. Um, so that's what's happening. And I hope you can see that you all are part of what's happening next. Some of you are already doing research. Maybe it's just personal, but it's still research. You may be coming coaches. You may be growing mushrooms. You may begin in the future to be running microdose groups. We don't know. Whatever you do that makes this world a more likely place for human survival is well worth doing. The government will be slower, it always has been, in, in taking in what we call real-world evidence and citizen science. 
<clears throat> and the organization MindMed that, that we're that we're that I'm very happy to be part of, I'm on an advisory board, has always taken the position that it is public opinion and public pressure that has allowed the government to move in the direction that it's supposed to, which is serving us. So thank you. Thank the staff and the volunteers that have brought you here and have moved Australia to be the first in the world. And thank you all personally for being here and allowing me to spend time with you. So such time as we have, let's see if there are questions and I will see if there are answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, that was amazing. Um, there are questions I've seen. There have been some coming up through the chat as I've been speaking. And if anyone would like to just even keep posting um, anything back in there. But one that I did see come up that I think is a really interesting question um, is, has there been any any evidence or any data that's come in on microdosing with minors? With minors? Hmm. I assume that's not people that work in mines, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, the, the rule of thumb is when people say, can I use this on young children? Uh, all of us research people know we're supposed to say no. And I was working, uh, I was talking with someone who had a, an autistic child. So this is not high functioning autism. This was what's called severe autism. Um, and he, and I said, I know it interests you. I know you have a lot of psychedelic experience, but I cannot recommend that you microdose your child. So a couple of weeks later, he said, I didn't take your advice. And what I can tell you about my child, who was five at the time, is when he, he's microdosed, he has he uses many more words. He's more um, stable emotionally, and he doesn't hit his head on the floor as often. Okay. Now, on and off, he he's an artist, so I get these wonderful things that he's done. And I got a message from him a few months ago. His child is now eight. He has moved from microdosing his child once, once or twice to once a month and now once every three weeks. What he says is it allows his child to reset himself. So again, increased emotional stability, heightened, uh, heightened ability to be interested in other things. Uh, he's much more uh, alert to what's going on in nature. Uh, he no longer hits his head. So um, that's what we're looking at. And and again, it's a, it's a very awkward place because as scientists and researchers, the general rule of thumb is don't offer anything to children. However, if we look at the number of children, and I don't know Australia, but I do know the United States, who are taking amphetamines every day hmm. for years, um, and it has a peculiar effect is it, it allows them to focus and to, to stabilize. Um, we do medicate children excessively. And so microdosing would be a safer alternative to look at. So it is a good question. And I wish we had a better answer, but we have that. See, you see what happens when you have a single case. It says this is possible for the human species. Mm -hmm. Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. I am aware that we're reaching 2.15, which, uh, which is our advertised ending time. Do you mind staying on for a few more minutes, Jim, to answer? Well, I'm very a few happy to. I, I actually, actually am much more interested in your questions because I already know what I talked about. <laughs> um, one question that I have seen a few people ask is whether it's possible to microdose whilst still being on pharmac other, other pharmaceutical oh, medications. Oh, goody, goody. Yes, yes. Uh, one of the major uses is people taking it two ways. One is you can stay on your pharmaceuticals. It has a very, very little effect on anything else, except if you wish to get off your pharmaceuticals, in this case, hundreds of cases of people, predominantly antidepressants, uh, it's hard to get off antidepressants. And some of them are, as, as psychiatrists say, much harder than others. Microdosing has been used extensively to allow you to make to get off of the SSRIs with less trouble. You can't stop taking SSRIs. It's terrible. 
but you can what's called in, in the medical trade taper off where you take less and less and less. And it may take several months to get off an SSRI. Microdosing makes that easier and somewhat faster, but it doesn't, uh, it is definitely, see the problem is you take SRIs, you don't feel well, you still feel depressed, take a microdose, you feel really good. Whoa, I'll just stop the antidepressant. No, you can't do that because your brain has now been um, rewired over the years so that without the antidepressants, it will behave poorly. So you have to taper off. What you do is you go to whoever is your prescriber and you say, I want to taper off. If they're able to handle the idea that you're also microdosing, let them know, but don't worry about it. That is a major use. And thank you. That's a very important question. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, one here, uh, I seem to be quite sensitive to psychedelics taking more like 4% rather than 10% of a gram of psilocybin. I often get symptoms of amplified feelings that are beneath the surface. Do I need to try less or more like a large macro to process this stuff? Less. You know, I'd love to just end with that, but um, there's a wonderful resource called Reddit, and there's a subedit called Microdosing. There's over 200,000 people on it, so it's just a, a heaven for people like me who want to ask questions. Someone asked that question, gee, I find that I can use less and it still seems to be effective. And there were like 30 people that responded and say, me too, me too, me too, me too. So the range I'm giving you, 10th of a gram to four tenths of a gram, that's for most people. Uh, the number of people who will want less, maybe 10 or 15%. The number of people who actually will need more is very small. Mm -hmm. fantastic uh thank you one question that i will ask you because i've seen a few people um could you just restate the protocols both in terms of dosing but also spacing um that you that are ideal i think a few people are, are keen to write it down i have missed it the first time there are two things dose first lsd mm -hmm. or some of its congeners and if you don't know what the word means don't take them um we're talking micrograms, millions of a gram, between seven and 12 micrograms is for most people. People, I know people say chronic migraines who have had incredible success with one microgram, one millionth of a gram, okay? Psilocybin, we're talking mushrooms, we're talking tenths of a gram, a tenth of a gram to four tenths of a gram for most people. And again, we just had the question, it can be much less, a tenth of that, um, so that's that's the dose. The protocol, which is how often, the the most popular protocol, and I, I'm not sure it's the best at all, but it's the most popular, it's called the Fadiman protocol. What can you do? Um, it's taking it one day on, two days off. Notice it's mostly off. One day on, two days off, one day on, two days off. After four to seven weeks, take a couple of weeks off. That's the start low, go slow, take time off. The most, the other, there are two other protocols. One is every other day. Uh, the the, in, the Microdosing Institute of the Netherlands, they have about, I think maybe 10,000 clients over the years. That's what they mainly use, works very well. Uh, there's also the Stamets stack. This is uh, taking it with another mushroom, lion's mane and a little bit of niacin. And Paul, says take it four, four days on, three days off, or five days on and two days off. And I said to Paul, hey, you've said both of these things on very large you know, programs with millions of viewers, which is right. He says, we can't be too strict. So, so the answer is days off, time off, and, and, and if you have side effects that you don't like, and this is, might include anxiety, it might include nausea, it might include headaches, I used to say to people, well, I guess it isn't for you. Nothing is for everybody. But then wiser people said, well, how about if I just cut the dose? So now when anyone has side effects that they are uncomfortable with, the first, first line of working on that is try half the dose. That handles about 85% of people. And there are some people for whom it isn't appropriate either at that time in their life or ever. Fantastic. So that's protocols and that's doses. Fantastic. Thank you. And in the, the comment of headaches, someone's asked a question here that you may understand, although it, it doesn't quite make entire sense to me, but histamine intolerance, uh, lack of DAO enzyme and microdosing, why can it lead to headaches? 
if you look up headache causes, it's a big list. If you look up headache treatments, it's a big list. And whenever you're finding a big list, what you know is nothing works that well, or you'd only have you know one treatment. Um, headaches are very complicated, lots of causes, um, everything from you know from lack of sleep to stress to life to uh, toxins, particularly. We no longer, you know, all of us right now have microplastics in our system. Um, the world is not as safe for organisms as it used to be. Headaches is a symptom of so many things that um, I'm not going to go down the science rabbit hole and pretend that there's a, one way of understanding them. Migraines, for instance, are headaches, but they're a totally different way of work of the brain and system working. Cluster headaches are a totally different group again, and so forth and so on. So the answer is I don't know. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, a question also uh, about a comment that you made earlier about a history of psychedelic use in Australia dating back thousands of years. Oh, I yeah. Mean, if you expand <laughs> on that a little bit. Well, uh, as, as most of you know, you are not the first uh, subgroup of human beings to come to Australia. Um, the Aborigines came 35,000 years ago. They also, and this is again, my friend Adam Brandage, who's doing a book on the first 35,000 years of microdosing. Um, there's a, a particular plant which has two uses in the Aboriginal world. One is if you throw it into a pond, the fish kind of, um, I suppose, really get stoned and just lie around on top to be taken. They're not, they don't die but they are able to be caught. And also it's used for walkabouts because one can function with a microdose without, with, with, that, with less food and less water. Um, and uh, very early, not a study. This is a jazz musician in the United States. First I heard of this in the 1940s, uh, going from town to town in a little rat trap of a, of a car with the other band members. What he said is I would put a peyote button with hatch has mescaline in it, it's a cactus, under my tongue, and I could drive all day. So that's a very early study of the use of these substances as are used by, uh, by Aborigines both 35,000 years ago and today. Hmm. Hmm. Fantastic. So, so you're not only the first country to make MDMA legal, you're the first country to do serious uh, ethnographic indigenous work with with microdoses <laughs> um, fantastic and perhaps this is a great uh question even for us to finish up on which is what resources would you recommend for further reading and how would you how would you suggest people uh, can <laughs> learn? oh my well um the reason <laughs> the reason that i'm writing a book with a friend called what you need to know about microdosing is so I don't have to answer those questions every day in my email. Um, there's, there is a lot of information out there and Google will help you. A uh, lot, of, lot of magazines and a lot of good people have said, what are the basic rules of microdosing? Uh, uh, there is a site coming back online, actually came up last week. Um, microdosingpsychedelics.org. It may have been .com, it's my site originally, but the people in Holland now, the Microdosing Institute, have taken it over and way, way upgraded it and uh, brought it up to speed. And it also, that site, Microdosing Psychedelics, will also lead you to information sources, will lead you to coaches, will lead you to trainings. Um, the trainings are international. Um, so any of you that are interested in being trained as a microdose um, coach or facilitator, um, so that's those are the that the source microdosingpsychedelics.com, the microdosing institute, and if you just Google your questions, by now there are pretty good answers out there. Fantastic, um, fantastic. So I think with that, perhaps we'll we'll call it a day um, or a night for you, Jim. And so to everyone who's joined us, I'd just like to say a huge thank you uh, for taking the time out of your work days to join us and to continue learning about this area. And to Jim, uh, the deepest heartfelt thanks for joining us today, but also for the continued ongoing support that you show well, for thank MMA, you. everything we're thank doing. for having me and, and may Australia continue to lead the world.
Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, good day, everybody. <laughs>